28-year-old Kenny Ung was born on July 18, 1974. She was the youngest child of three girls to Chinese and Indian parents Ung Bi Jang and Perli Vishwanathan. Kenny was born and raised in Malaysia, but then pursued university in Hawaii to study economics. There, she met her future husband, Brandon Ung, who she married in 2001. He was born to Chinese parents who immigrated from Singapore to the U.S. Together, they moved out to San Diego, California, where Kenny worked as an information technology analyst. However, in early 2003, Kenny received the news that her father was suffering from cancer. She and her husband then planned to travel to Malaysia to visit her father on June 1st. Fortunately, her father's condition improved and he was recovering, so they were set to return back to San Diego on June 14, 2003. But just the day before their trip back, things would take the sharpest turn for the worst. On this night, Kenny went out to a farewell dinner for steak and fried crabs with her family and close friends at Monday Restaurant in the Bangstar shopping complex. After the meal, seeing that her mother became tired, she offered to drive her mother back home before she continued with the farewell party. As Kenny went to pay the parking ticket, she suddenly forgot that she left the physical ticket in the car. She then told them that she'd grab the ticket from the car in the parking garage quickly, while her mother and sister waited for her at the auto pay machine. But when 20 minutes passed by and she never came back, they became worried. Her sister Elsie made two calls to her cell phone. The first was not answered, while the second was sent straight to voicemail. Together, they both went to the car park and found their car, a purple Proton Tierra, gone. After pleading with the security guards, her mother, sister, and her friends, together with security personnel, viewed the CCTV footage, and what they saw was horrifying. They saw Candy being approached and hastily abducted by an unidentified man. More than an hour after Candy was gone, a police report was made. At around midnight, Two policemen patrolling on a motorcycle found Kenny's car, and upon approaching it, they saw her with a man inside. One officer showed his police ID and asked to see both of their ID cards, which they both gave. The police then asked them to step out of the car, but the man refused and even stopped Kenny from getting out of the car. She made a series of strange hand gestures towards the officer in efforts to seek help, but the officer could not understand. The abductor then quickly drove off after he maintained his refusal to get out of the car, and the policemen, who still held on to the IDs of Candy and her kidnapper, quickly fired shots at the car and attempted to give chase, but they lost sight of the car. The IDs later became a major clue in identifying the last person with Candy, and it was 27-year-old Ahmad Najib. Ahmad was born sometime in 1976 and was raised in Moa, Malaysia. He was the second of four siblings in his family and studied up to his third year in secondary school. Since secondary school in Malaysia lasts five years and with only two to complete, he had to leave school and work instead to support his family. He was later married with two young children and employed as an airplane cabin cleaner in Malaysia Airlines since 2000. According to those who knew him, he was described as hardworking and a man of good character and responsible in his work. In 1998, he moved from Wat to Kuala Lumpur, where Kani was on her final day. After running from the policemen, Ahmad and Kani were spotted alive again when he stopped the car along Jalan Sungai Way to replace a car tire, which was punctured by a bullet shot by the police officers earlier. A woman named Amina Izahak was only 20 feet from the car while waiting in her brother-in-law's car when she was approached by Ahmad to borrow a jack to remove the tire. She said while he was struggling with the wheel, she saw Kani making odd faces at her trying to signal for help. 
feeling that something was off, Amina copied down the car's license plate, which she did just in time when Ahmad drove off again, having given up replacing the car tire. Together with her brother-in-law, she went to report the incident at a nearby police station and provided them with the plate. Between 1 a.m. and 5 a.m., Ahmad Najib sexually assaulted Kani in the Proton Tierra under a bridge that was still under construction. Afterwards, he used a knife to stab Kani twice. Her body was then pushed into a narrow hole on the side of the highway, and two large tires containing cement were placed over her. Her car was then abandoned at a nearby shop house. Ahmad fled in a taxi, and the following day he bought petrol with a plan to burn the body. He went back to the hole, poured the oil, and burned the corpse. Unknown to him was another witness in the case, Azizan Ismail. He was a van driver who stopped by the road construction to ease himself before seeing a topless woman lying on the back seat of the car. He also described a man with a balding head attempting to quickly drive away. His attention then turned to the front right tire of the car, which was flat. He mistook them as a pair of lovers and continued his journey to his office. Two hours later, he returned to the same road and saw that same car parked 100 meters from where it was at first. He came towards the car to find it unlocked, found a Nokia phone and backpack, and took them both home with him. While heading to his wife's house, he used the phone a few times to call her. Once he reached a rest area on the way, he opened the backpack and found various kinds of pens, cigarettes, a lighter, a large brown paper, and a box of condoms. There were two condoms wrapped in aluminum foil and one empty aluminum foil left in the box. The next day, he sold the Nokia phone and the SIM and used the money for gas. A few days later, he was told by his wife to contact a policeman, and when he did, he was told to go to the police headquarters. He was shown a picture of the Proton Tierra in a newspaper and a picture of Ahmad Najib. The police had traced the handphone to him and two other people, but later released them upon arresting Ahmad. In the morning, Kenny's remains were discovered by a construction site manager. She was found with a cloth around her neck, her hands crossed over her chest, and her legs dangling out of the hole. The police, having received reports of her disappearance, arrived at the scene and brought the body for forensic testing, and her family was contacted to identify her. Her abandoned car was also discovered by the police. An autopsy revealed that she was strangled before her body was set on fire. Semen was also found. On June 20, 2003, Ahmad Najib was arrested as a suspect and the DNA test confirmed that the semen matched him. He actually fully confessed to the police that he had indeed killed Kenny. He made a full-length confession of the crime and even led the police to the various crime scenes related to the sexual assault and murder. Shockingly, he also admitted in his confession that he went to the shopping center wanting to look for a woman he had a grudge with, and the woman was his former employee. But he had mistook Candy for that woman and only realized the mistake when the policeman later checked their IDs. Ahmad was formally charged with murder and rape, and the media reports of the case brought shock to the entire country of Malaysia. Police investigations also found that he was linked to and allegedly committed four car park rape cases, which led to speculations that he could be a serial rapist. However, police officers could not formally charge or investigate him with these cases, as the victims, and some of them were married, did not want to let people know about their identities as his previous rape victims. Kenny Ung's funeral was held on June 27, 2003. Over 500 people from the public attended the funeral to offer their condolences and peacefully lay her to rest, including some politicians. Her family and friends were also present.
The trial took place three months after Candy's murder. If found guilty, Ahmad faced mandatory death penalty. Despite already confessing, he pleaded not guilty, claiming that he was forced, tortured, and coerced by the police to make a confession. His lawyer, Mohammed Hanif, who was a notable lawyer in Malaysia, tried to challenge the validity of the confession. In rebuttal, the magistrate who was present when Ahmad was first charged testified that he seemed relaxed and had no physical injuries on him and had voluntarily made the confession. The judge then admitted the confession as evidence. Other than the confession, forensic evidence and the chemist's report also linked Ahmad Najib to the crime, especially the clothes that he wore that night had some traces of Kenny's DNA. The cloth he used to strangle Kenny was the same type that airplane cleaners used to wipe plane windows, and given his occupation, this further linked him to the crime. A criminologist and psychiatrist present confirmed that he was not psychotic and can function as usual. He also had good relationships with his family, colleagues, and neighbors. His defense lawyer questioned parts of the prosecution's case, specifically why Candy did not take a chance to escape the car when Ahmad was busy trying to replace the tire. And given that Candy had a black belt in martial arts, it wouldn't have been impossible for her to escape his clutches, which led to some people questioning why. However, some of the experts interviewed in the case rebutted these claims, saying that it was easier said than done and no blame should be placed on the victim for her failure to escape. They believed it wasn't possible for her to escape since she had no idea where she was and it was late. They also believed imagination and reality are different when it comes to such a situation that Candy was in, had it been another person facing a similar situation. His defense lawyer also argued that other people could have been responsible for the murder of Canny by bringing up the finances of her family and the disappearance of her wedding ring that she wore at the time. They also said the cement-filled tires were heavy and would have likely needed much more strength to move them. The police officers conceded, but refused to agree with the defense that more than one person could have been involved. Finally, his defense lawyer tried to undermine the victim's dignity, saying that Candy could have consented to having sex with Ahmad, and the move of which he tied the cloth around her neck was part of their act, and perhaps the death could be of an accidental and consensual sexual asphyxia. However, the forensic pathologist said such acts do not occur in a car on the roadside, but in places away from the public eye. They also mentioned the stabbings and how the death was caused by strangulation. Further, they testified that the only area on her body not charred by the fire was the skin under the ligature tied around her neck, which demonstrated how brutally tight the cloth was tied. The prosecution believed the defense was not making any sense in any rebuttals and did not raise a reasonable doubt over the case against Ahmad. Almost a year later in August 2004, Ahmad was called to give his defense, and upon discussing with his six lawyers, he chose to remain silent, much to the shock of the public and the court. Under Malaysian law, if a person chooses to remain silent, the judge would have to convict the defendant. However, his defense lawyer argued that his decision to remain silent was not a move to indicate to the judge that the judge's decision to convict him is correct. And he said that if so, then the right to remain silent is not a legal option under the law. The prosecution reiterated that if the prosecution's case was left unrebutted and the accused chose to remain silent, the accused is ought to be found guilty of the charges he was tried for in court. The Shah Alam High Court found Ahmad Najib guilty of the murder and rape of Kani Ung. The judge said that the evidence against him was overpowering and the prosecution had proven beyond a reasonable doubt that he had indeed committed the crimes. Ahmad was then sentenced to death. For the rape, they sentenced him to 20 years imprisonment, the maximum sentence under Malaysian law for rape, 
along with 10 strokes of the cane. Afterwards, Ahmad told reporters that he accepted the court's decision, but he indicated that he will appeal against the conviction and sentence. Between 2007 and 2009, Ahmad appealed his conviction three times to spare his life, to the Court of Appeals, the federal courts, and even begged the Sultan of Salango for pardon, but all were rejected. While on death row, Ahmad was described as a good Muslim, as prison officers said he often led other inmates in prayer and taught them about religion. But on September 23, 2016, more than 13 years later, 40-year-old Ahmad Najib was executed by hanging in Kajang prison. His body was returned to his family and later buried. The outcome also brought some closure to Kani's bereaved loved ones, acquaintances, and the larger population. Her mother responded, I don't know what to say. I think whatever happened was planned by God. I am not angry with anyone. I don't want anyone to die, but justice must prevail. I sympathize with his children for losing a father. She said her husband or Kani's father could not bear to attend the proceedings, saying, he still takes it very badly. She came back to see him. We have lost three children altogether. She's referring to Kenny, the loss of a son due to a fever, and the drowning of a baby girl some 20 years ago. She hopes that Brandon Ung, Kenny's husband, meets another girl, gets married again, and moves on one day. He still kept Kenny's things, and she told him life has to go on. She also said, as for me, I find it too hard to cope at times. I dare not think of Kenny. I think she's beside me. I don't think she's in the memorial park where her ashes are kept. My Kiani, the nickname given to her as a child, was a good girl who came back to see her father, she said, holding back tears. Taking it more philosophically, she added, life must go on. 19 years later, our thoughts go out to the Ong family, praying for their happiness, healing, and recovery from such a devastating loss. May Kenny Ong rest in paradise, and thank you all for watching.